Dr. Sage here, back to continue our discussion of the eukaryotes that we study in microbiology. In today's video, we're going to discuss the helminths. By the end of this video, you should be able to list the two major groups of helminths and provide examples representing each body type. You should also be able to summarize the stages of a typical helminth life cycle. The helminths are usually large enough to be seen with the naked eye, ranging from 1 millimeter to 25 meters in length. The two major groups of helminths are the round worms, or nematodes, and the flat worms, which are broken down into the flukes, or triatodes, and tapeworms, or cestodes. Helminths are multicellular animals equipped with organs and organ systems. In them, their reproductive tract is the most developed. They have primitive digestive, excretory, nervous, and muscular systems. They have a thick cuticle for protection, and they have mouth glands for breaking down the host tissues. An example of their morphology is their mouth. The visible suckers and hooks allow the worm to attach itself to the inner wall of the intestine. A couple of examples, you have the oral sucker that's clearly visible on this liver fluke. And in this cestode, which is the pork tapeworm, you can clearly see the scolex, including the hook and the suckers. The majority of helminths drive nutrients and reproduce sexually in the host body. Their complete life cycle includes a fertilized egg, a larval stage, and an adult stage. So in the nematodes, which are round worms, we have sexes with different morphologies. Here's an example of a nematode of a roundworm. This is known as a pinworm. Then among the flatworms, we have the trematodes, which are the flukes. The sexes are separate or they can be hermaphroditic, which means male and female sex organs are in the same worm. Here's a couple of examples, the common liver fluke and the giant liver fluke. Continuing the flatworms, we have the cestodes or the tapeworms, which are generally hermaphroditic. Here's an example of a tapeworm that infects both humans and cattle which can reach lengths from four to 10 meters long. The general life cycle of the helminths is transmission of an egg or larva to the body of another host, either a different or same species. Then you can have an intermediate or secondary host, the host in which the larval development occurs. And then you have the final or definitive host, that's the host in which adulthood and mating occurs. Here's an example of a general life cycle Released in the feces, you can have eggs. These eggs then infect the intermediate or secondary host, such as cows or pigs. In these intermediate hosts, you have development of the larval stages. Then you have infection of the definitive or final host, in this case, humans. This happens by humans becoming infected by ingesting raw or undercooked infected meat. In this definitive or final host, you have development out into adulthood and reproduction. So the sources for human infection include food, soil, water, and infected animals. Routes of infection can be oral intake or penetration of the skin. Humans are the definitive host for many species and the sole biological reservoir for about half of the diseases. Animals or insect vectors also serve as reservoirs. Here's an example of a helminth cycle for the pinworm. The pinworm causes a very common infestation of the large intestine. Worms range from 2 to 12 millimeters long. They have a tapered or cylindrical shape. It involves a simple, uncomplicated infection that does not spread past the intestine. Eggs are released through fecal matter. These are then ingested in the embryonic stage. Larvae hatch in the small intestine. And then adults you'll find inside the large intestine, where those adults will then lay eggs to continue the cycle. So how do we classify and identify the helminths? Well, many different ways of classifying them. We can classify them based on their shape, their size, degree of development of organs, presence of hooks, suckers, or other special structures, mode of reproduction, the kind of host they infect, and the appearance of eggs or the larva. We identify them through microscopic detection of the adult worm, larva, or eggs, because they often have distinctive shapes or external or internal structures. They're occasionally cultured to verify all the life stages. There are about 50 species of helminths that are parasites of humans. They're distributed in all areas of the world that support human life. Some may be geographically restricted, and you often find a higher incidence in tropical areas. Yearly estimates of infections worldwide case in the billions. 
A conservative estimate would be that we have about 50 million infections in North America alone per year. Humans evolved in the constant presence of helmets. Only recently have humans evolved into a helmet-free existence. And in fact, absence of helmet infections may contribute to autoimmunity and allergies. So we conclude our discussion of the eukaryotes that we study in microbiology by discussing the helminths. Compared to the other microorganisms we study in microbiology, helminths have multicellular adult stages and then unicellular egg and larva stages. They don't have a cell wall. Their cytoplasm is not divided. They're heterotrophs, not autotrophs. They can have flagella. And important structures for identifying them is the ova. So this has been a brief overview of the helminths that we study in microbiology. Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.